fun. No, I deleted it. <laughs> He's the only one that did it, I believe. Okay. Um, I gave you back the previous test, not the test you took yesterday. I, you've already had it given back to you on Moodle. I just forgot to give back the paper copy. And of course, if you have questions about it, feel free to bring them up. But with yesterday's test, afterward, I was talking to a student, we'll call him Nathan, and he said, what in the world was going on with this one? I worked this problem like 10 times. <laughs> I'm sure my answer's right. And he's correct. And I'll tell you what I did wrong. It's not exciting, but it's the truth. Is it the first one? Yes. yes. Oh my gosh. Oh, I gave up. I was like, look at this. That's your equation, right? Oh my yes. god. Yes. I put V there. So my answer was gamma minus one oh my and V squared. And so it was incorrect. And I totally apologize because I know. You assume that there's going to be a correct answer here, and if you don't have it, you must have done something wrong. So now comes the question, what do I do about this? Yeah. yeah. What was the answer supposed to be? Um, yeah, 3.2 something times 10 to the, what, 19? Yeah. Yeah. What should I do? Anyone have any like look at people's work maybe and then give like take out the question but give bonus for what they did. Take out the question but give bonus for what they did. Yeah. So so you're just just making sure I, I'm, I'm not committing just what what you're saying is make the test out of ninety points and then grade it like normal partial credit and so people could you know if they did it perfectly, which I'm sure a number of people did. Then they would have an extra ten points possible. Something like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. I What's yours? I other people, but when I saw that my answer wasn't on the multiple choice options, I crossed it out, and some people might have erased their uh -huh. answer and wanted to do some other one. That's so true. That's true. Yeah, that's, that's a fear. That's a fear of mine. I don't know if that's fair. When I saw I wasn't getting the correct answer, I just moved on to something else, like trying to go a different. Same. That's what I was gonna say. I, I feel like I I don't remember quite what I did, but I felt like I I got that answer at some point, but it wasn't a choice, so I just circled. So you went on. Answer. So it must be something else I'm associating. What what's the best solution? I mean, <laughs> I want to be fair, well, and I also made a mistake. What was the average for tests? Um, I only well, if you look at what it gives me just with the right and wrong, um. The average was probably just a little over 50. Now, obviously, I'm going to do some scaling and whatnot. Um, I have graded exactly one. That person had 50 with the Scantron score and 70 with, you know, doing the after grade. So, obviously, the, the scores are not what the Scantron says because you have partial credit and whatnot. Um, but I, I can't make any definitive statements because I haven't so graded them. Manual. So even if you grade it manually, it, I, I don't know. I don't know what they're going to be like when I grade the manual. I'm just telling you what I do know right now. Okay, so for this one, our plan is dot, dot, dot. Yes, that's what I'm asking you. For this one, our plan is dot, dot, dot. Trick. So I, mean, I like Andrew's idea of just taking it out and adding it as a bonus, but at the same time, like, None of us, including you, we don't know what everybody did. Yeah. Get along, you know? I mean, if, if everybody has their work showing they did it right, and then they have other work trying to figure out what in the world, you know, then it's easy. I just give everyone yeah. full credit, right? It's if they erase something that we have an issue. And so I think that we should applaud his idea, and then as you look over, we're like, oh, this is not going to work, and then let's come up with some other ideas in case that's not the case. Okay. I, I like that idea. Let's see what we have before we make a firm decision. Um, Nathan, what was your? Uh, uh, yeah, I'm just concerned about you know, the people who are, who have changed who have changed yeah. their work. Um, I mean, how do you know how many points to give them? Yes. Um, yeah, I probably think um, that maybe 
we should just admit the problem. Okay, Andrew, what were you going to say? Um, well, I was just going to kind of say, like, I don't know, maybe after what you said, maybe that's a better idea. But then also, like, if you just take away the question and don't give any points for it, if someone missed, like, you know, didn't. If, if that was what they were banking on, yeah. 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 that section is kind of screwed. Yeah. Yeah. You have a point. I have a point. So let me go to Wes and then to Lydia. Um, just a couple questions. Did everybody stay for the end of the allotted time in the test? Um, yeah, some stay? people stayed uh, 45 minutes after. Oh, no, no, there were people who finished early. But did, was there at least some people that stayed for the entire amount of the allotted time? Um, yeah. Well, that means that uh, some people might have spent way too much time. On that one problem, yeah. That, problems, that might factor in, too. Yeah. If everybody yeah. finished early, then it doesn't matter because they have extra time. Well, I didn't, I didn't kick anyone out per se. I did when we got to 40 after. I said, you know, I'm getting 40 extra minutes. It'd be nice if you finish up soon. And, oh, Lydia first. Um, my suggestion could be maybe get, because I did what Wes was talking about. I spent way too much time on that problem mm -hmm. because that was the one that I felt the strongest on, but I couldn't get the correct answer. So towards the end of the, the test, I had to guess on quite a few because I didn't simply have time. Um, is there a possible way that we could do that problem again in class as like a as like a kind of a retake? Like if we put in different numbers and we did that problem, that synthesis problem, just here in class on our own as if we were in the test, and that be counted towards it? Instead. I I don't feel strong about doing that because I presume that after being faced with it. And knowing what the problem is, we can all sit down and figure out the correct way to do it. And so it wouldn't really be testing anything doing it that way. Um, your, your previous statement, though, is very, very much an important one. Spending a lot of time on this one because you felt confident on it, to the detriment of other problems. I know I spent a lot of time on that problem. Like, I, put it all, I, did, like, I know I did everything right. It's just like yeah. I lost a lot of time. I, know. I, I, I look at Nathan's, you know, obviously, I look at his. And he said, I calculated it literally 10 times. <laughs> I keep getting the same answer. So yeah, that makes sense. Um, mine was kind of what Lydia said. I was going to say, like, maybe we could just like do it as a class or like send it to us on Moodle. We can fill it out, turn it in, and then that. But I don't know. Yeah, I, I, would give, I would give everyone full credit on probably before I do that, just because that saves you time and it would be the same outcome. Yeah. Um, yeah, you can just give a full credit. That's <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Well, I, I will take what Trey said. I will go through and do grading on the whole test and then think about it and what to do. I want to make sure you know what's going on and not be shocked or startled. Yeah, the average is pretty low. Like, like that person who got 50% on the scan but then they only got 40%. For me, do you need the average is 50%? So you have to add well, the velocities. Yeah, and you put the velocities in the game. You put the game with the game. I can only ask you guys that's what we like. Yeah. I can do it. Yeah, I can do it. 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 I mean, obviously, you have to wait until you finish grading. Yeah. Yeah. Would that be a possibility? Yeah. The, well, the, no, the, the, the question was could we like go through and redo questions we missed and get back like half credit on that like, as a take on thing? Um, I, probably. I don't have that kind of memory. I have memory about classes this semester. But yeah, so I'll, I'll keep these in mind and I'll keep you updated. I have sent your posters off to the printer, so hopefully those will be back Monday. Continuing on talking about the atoms. Now, I've, I'm using the same slideshow. Oh, it reminds me, I need to, while I'm lecturing, oh, right here, I didn't give you this. This is the previous example. I need to fire up a, a great website so we can look at some of this stuff as we go along. But we had four quantum numbers. What can you tell me about those quantum numbers? A, 
They contain things. It means excitation to go from one to the other. Okay, that's talking about the energy levels. One of the quantum numbers tells us primarily about the energy level. And that's the one on this slide here. The principal quantum number is the most important one, generally speaking, because it tells us about the energies. Those are the things that we can interact with the easiest. We have something that they used to do long ago. You take a piece of wire filament, you put it in a flame, and you look at what color it burns. The color you're seeing there comes from these. And so the principal quantum number tells you about those. So there's a fundamental, very important quantum number. So you have the principal quantum number that primarily tells us about the energy. What's another quantum number? Spin. Okay, the spin. Jumping right to the last one that I haven't talked about, I don't think. So I'm not going to talk about the spin right here because I don't think I've lectured on it yet. But that's one of them. Other quantum numbers. Yeah. Principal quantum number n. Orbital. The spin. Okay, we have the orbital quantum number. L. And L, what does it tell us? The probability of finding said electron in a certain area. It's actually the wave function. It's one of the things we study though. L, the orbital quantum number, tells us something important. It's not just something we throw around in chemistry class. It tells us Go ahead, Jack. I put him on the spot. I put him on the spot for the last two angular momentum. It tells us the angular momentum of the orbital. Not of the electron, but of the electron's orbit. And so we have, it can have zero angular momentum, or it can have square root of 2 times h bar, or square root of 6 times h bar. So we have the, the orbital angular momentum quantum number L, and this is the equation, which we saw last class period, to tell us what the angular momentum of the orbital is. And then we have one more quantum number. So we have the principal quantum number that tells us the energy, the orbital quantum number that tells us the total angular momentum. We have the spin, which we haven't talked about. There's one last one. The magnetic quantum number. And the magnetic quantum number tells us how it interacts with the magnetic fields. It tells us how the energy levels shift when you put it in a magnetic field. But there's an internal reason for that. It's telling us about the orientation of the angular momentum. So L tells us the angular momentum. M sub L tells us about the orientation of the angular momentum. M sub L is what I have here. That's a unique word there. It tells us about its orientation of its angular angular momentum. So we put those three plus spin together and we get the entire state. So here's introducing spin. How was spin discovered? Well, looking at the spectra, they saw that little fine structure that you had, what should be one line is actually split into two very close lines. And to try to explain, somebody said, well, it's acting like the electrons have a magnetic moment, not just the orbital magnetic moment. Think about this for a moment. We've learned that we can make, well, we have a group that made a generator. That's the reverse of what I'm talking about. Generator, you have a magnet moving, and it induces a current. But we also learned that if you have a current flowing, if you're amped like Michael, you have a current flowing, it makes a magnetic field. It sure says it. <laughs> it makes a magnetic field. And so they said, well, the electron orbiting the nucleus is going to make a magnetic field because you have a charged particle. <laughs> Originally, they said going in a circle. Now we just say we don't know what it's doing, but it still has any momentum. And so it's making a magnetic moment. But then there was additional magnetic moments. So they said, well, maybe the electron itself is rotating, and it's making a magnetic moment because it's spinning. And so they called that property spin. And we can calculate how big the angular momentum of the electron has to be to make that spin. But then we run into problems when reality sets in. It turns out that the electron, we don't know if an electron, some people believe electrons don't have any volume, that they have no volume, they're just a point. Other people, nah, they must have a volume. But we can calculate that their volume has to be smaller than a very small amount. 
And if it's, as, if it's as large as the smallest we calculate, there's no possible way it could be rotating to make that magnetic field. So we now know that spin is a misnomer. Electrons don't spin. We still call it the spin property, but they don't spin. So what is it? But we, we've already taken into account the orbit. That's what the L is telling us about. So we've already got that accounted for. That definitely is happening. But we have something on top of it. That's in the way. The answer we've come up with is it's intrinsic. It's just like it has mass. It has a magnetic moment. So you can think of an electron like a little bar magnet. It's just intrinsic to it. And in fact, when we talk about the magnetism of atoms, we're talking about this effect. We're talking about the intrinsic magnetic moments that you have for the protons, the neutrons, the electrons, and adding in the orbital. All those things play into your magnetism to some effect. So the spin is a measurement of the intrinsic magnetic moment of the electron. And it turns out that when we calculate electrons based on this magnetic moment, we calculate a, let's say, a hypothetical angular momentum that's intrinsic to the electron. And that hypothetical intrinsic angular momentum is always a bar times 3 quarters, square root of 3 quarters, excuse me. That's always the, the angular momentum of an electron. It has a spin of 1 half. It's the only variable or option you have for the spin of an electron, 1 half. Protons and neutrons likewise. They can only have a spin of one half. But with that spin of one half, you have two possible orientations that it can take on. It can have, remember we have the M, the magnetic Quantum number. It varies from plus L to minus L, which tells our orientations are somewhere like that. With the spin, we have the same rule. The, the spin's orientation can go from plus one half to minus one half. And so that gives us only two values, which we usually call spin up and spin down. So spin up means that your orientation is in the direction that we randomly call up. Spin down means it's down. And realistically, I think I have a picture. I hope I didn't take it out. <laughs> Going way back. Oh, nope. I took it out. I'm tired of swiping through. So the, and I'm lecturing on this this afternoon if you want to come. The spin can be at this level, the angle momentum in the z direction due to spin equals one half h bar or down here minus one half h bar. That's what spin up and spin down mean that the orientation of the intrinsic angle momentum is like this. Remember the maximum square root of three quarters which is bigger than one half. So it can't be pointing straight with the magnetic field, or it's like this. That's what it means when you're saying spin up or spin down. Now, just a polling question. How many people knew that's what spin up and spin down meant? Right, when I took chemistry classes, it was just spin, the end. No understanding of what it was. So, yeah, there's the values that I've just been saying. Spin up and spin down. And you can draw these like that or that, down and up. So now we have four quantum numbers. And technically, the spin up and spin down is m sub s. Magnetic again. It's the magnetic quantum number associated with spin versus m sub l, the magnetic quantum number associated with angular momentum. I'm just going to go straight to my summary. How many quantum numbers are required to specify the state of a hydrogen atom? 
It was my first statement when I started lecturing. Four. And what are the names? That was my first question. I'm writing down what people say. Two more. Principal, which is N. And what is L? Now, what are the rules for these? Okay, L can go from zero up to n minus 1. So L is integer starting at 0 going up to n minus 1. Other rules? n is integer is positive integers going up to uh, going up to infinity. Spin can only be a half or an half. One left. Negative L. L. Okay, so those are quantum numbers, their names, and finally, what does the principal number quantum number primarily tell you? Energy level. What does the orbital quantum number primarily tell you? Angular momentum. If you're a chemist, instead of saying angular momentum, you talk about the morphology and you say it tells you the orbital. Hence the term orbital quantum number. But those orbitals go with an angular momentum. What does M sub L tell you? The orientation of angular momentum. And what does M sub S tell you? Okay, the orientation of, and I'll put in quotes, of the spin. Because remember, the spin is not what we think it is, but sometimes the orientation of the spin, the orientation of its intrinsic angular momentum. Or more accurately, its intrinsic magnetic moment. Yeah, so here's the summary of what we just wrote down, except for we don't have the uh, what they tell you. So in case something wasn't clear to you in the way I wrote things down, the ends, one, two, three, et cetera, the L's from zero up to N minus one, the M sub L is going minus L, minus L plus one, minus L plus two, et cetera, until you get to L minus one, L. So this is something you should definitely know. It's something that will definitely be questions on the final exam that just ask about how these numbers relate and what they mean. So let's talk about filling electrons in the periodic table. You guys have probably all dealt with the periodic table at some point in your life. This is called the Mendelevian periodic table of elements because Mendeleev came up with this. And what Mendeleev was trying to do was he was trying to take the elements that were known, which is nothing close to what we have today, and organize them in a fashion to make it easier to, to work with. And so he said, I'm going to make a different column for different chemical properties. And then different <coughs> atoms that have similar chemical properties, I'm going to put in the same column. So those columns we call groups. And then you have the, the top one. And then you go, as you go down, they're more massive. So the lowest mass is at the top, and then you go down. And so we have our periods going across. And, of course, it's been refined a lot, but that was – considered the best method of making a periodic table. But now that we have quantum physics, we understand where it comes from, and we can correct little mistakes that Mendeleev had when he tried to organize them. Because, you know, when you think about it, how do you differentiate the properties of you know, nickel, copper, zinc? It's kind of hard to differentiate their chemical properties. They do similar things. And so 
some of those metals easily could have been in the wrong column. But now we have a good way of understanding exactly where they should be and what they are. So the organization of that periodic table, as it is in today's world, has each period is telling us which shell we started filling on that line. So the shells are numbered with n. The principal quantum number tells us the shell. So n equals 1 is the first period, n equals 2 is the second, and so on. For the first two elements at least. And then as we go across, we're adding electrons. Now, the Pauli exclusion principle has to be mentioned at this point. I don't know if I have it on my next slide or five slides from now, so I'm just saying it now so we can get it out of the way. With quantum physics, we are able to calculate that there is no wave function possible if you have two indistinguishable fermions, particles with one half integer spin are called fermions, so electrons are fermions, so are protons, so are neutrons. You cannot have a wave function if you have two fermions with the same set of quantum numbers. You have to have an anti-symmetric spatial um, wave function, and it turns out if you have two indistinguishable particles, you can't have one. And so that gives us what we call the Pauli exclusion principle that says for any fermion, you can't have two indistinguishable fermions in the same exact state. So we have four quantum numbers, right? If any one of those is different, then we don't have a problem. But if all four quantum numbers are the same, for an electron in the same, for two electrons in the same atom, it can't exist. Now, I, when I was at your level, I was like, well, okay, I have this hydrogen atom and this hydrogen atom. You're telling me that I can't have two electrons in the same state in those two hydrogen atoms? That's a misunderstanding. I didn't understand it fully. The Pauli exclusion principle applies for indistinguishable particles. If I have an electron with this hydrogen atom and an electron with this hydrogen atom, I can distinguish them. This one goes with this H, this one goes with this H. So they can have the same energy state. But in one hydrogen atom, or let's say one helium, because helium typically has two electrons, you can't have two electrons with the same state. One of those quantum numbers has to be different. Now, when you look at those quantum numbers, N, L, M sub L, and M sub S, which one is primarily going to determine the energy? N. The principal quantum number primarily determines the energy. So that means when I put the electrons in, N is going to be the hardest one to change because every most energy. Which one is going to be a secondary indicator of energy? That's a trickier question. That's L. And so L is going to be less likely to change. Then the next least likely, M sub L. And the last, the one that makes the littlest difference on the energy, M sub S. So I put my first electron into a hydrogen atom or a helium atom, whatever, copper atom. So the first electron, the first, it doesn't matter. <laughs> it's, it's copper 20-something at this point. So the first electron is going to go to N equals 1. L, what values can L have if N equals 1? Zero. Zero is it. And what values can M sub L have then? And what values can M sub S have? So it doesn't really matter. The first electron is going to go in, and we'll just arbitrarily say it's going to go into this set of numbers. Now, the N is telling us the shell. And we'll write this as a 1 for the shell. So that first number is the shell. Then we're going to write a letter to tell us what L is. And so L, and we talked about this, oh, it's been more than a week ago now. But L equals 0 is S. L equals 1 is P. L equals 2 is D. L equals 3 is F. And then it's alphabetical order after that. Um, skipping J. Now I know it since I said it wrong when we talked about it before. So this is going to be a 1s because L is equal to 0. And the first electron is just the first one in. So we put a 1 here to say it's one electron in the 1s. 
The second electron is going to have these same numbers, but it's going to have to go to the other M sub S. And so the second electron is going to be the one S two, two in the S. What about the third electron? Why doesn't the copper have an N of four? We've got a whole lot of electrons to go into copper, but we'll get to that. Okay. So where's what's the third electron going to be? going to be two, negative one. Okay. We've already filled up all of the possible N equals one states. So now we go to N equals two. What values can we have for L? Or? So we have zero or one. M sub L, if it's zero, what values can we have for M sub L? If it's one, what values can we have for M sub L? <laughs> so we have different options here. And then M sub S is again equal to one half or minus one half. So the first electron that goes in, well, the third one, excuse me, it's going to take the N equals two. It's going to take the zero for the L because that's going to be a lower energy state than L equals one. And then with zero, it has to be M sub L is zero. And then we'll just arbitrarily choose the one half again. But well, spin doesn't have a lower energy state but equal energy. There, there is. We'll, we'll get to that. I, I, I will discuss it. So the third electron is going to be two s one because n is equal to two l is equal to zero so it's an s now let's jump ahead to the fifth electron and i'm going to stop with this when we get to the fit after the fifth one the fifth electron so we've done the fourth electron was two s two so the fifth electron we've now taken all of the possible two S's. So what's the next state going to be the next energy? It's going to be the two P that is L is equal to one. And so that's going to go to P and then I'll just arbitrarily choose the minus one here and the, and so that's going to be a two P one. Now, if we look at the periodic table, actually, I think, well, I should finish this off. We had two electrons that could go into the S. Why? Because you have only one M or only one value for M sub L and then two values of M sub S for each M sub L. In the P, you had three values for M sub L and then for each of those, two M sub S's. So three times two is six. For the D, you have five. That's two, one, zero, minus one, minus two for the M sub L. Two electrons for each, so 10. And so you have 1 times 2, 3 times 2, 5 times 2, 7 times 2, 9 times 2, and so on. So that's how many electrons can go in each orbital. That's Hoon's rule, and I do want to talk about it. This here, okay, I was going to say, I did a lot of work to make sure that this would actually zoom in. This shows the electrons filling. So what we can see here is hydrogen has only one electron, so it's 1s1. Helium has two electrons, so the second electron was 1s2. The third electron in would be lithium is the third one. 1s2, because it has two electrons in the 1s. And then 2s1, because it has one electron there. So beryllium... 2s2, 2, 2, two, or 1s2, 2s2. We go on from beryllium, we go to the P's, and we have to shift over here. Here I'm filling a P, so we have a 2p1. And since you can put in 6, you have 2p1, 2p2, 2p3, 2p4, 2p5, and 2p6. What makes these last column the noble gases? What makes them noble? Okay, the valence shells are filled. There is a 
lower energy if you can have them all filled. And so those are extra stable. They don't want to gain or give up electrons, so they are inert. Now, if we come down here, we get to the stuff that is interesting. Sodium, 3S1. Magnesium, 3S2. What do we fill next? After we've done L equals zero, we go to L equals one. And which orbital is the L equals one? P. So we should have over here 3P. Yep, 3P1, 3P2, et cetera. What happens when I filled up all of the P's? I filled up 3S, I filled up 3P. Instead of going to 3D, to 4S. Right, 3D is totally available to us. But it starts filling 4S. What does that tell you if it goes to 4S instead of going to 3D? S is more stable than D. It tells you that you have a lower energy if you put an electron to 4S than if you put it to 3D. It always wants to go to the lowest possible energy. So that tells you, yeah, definitely the N is not just telling you the energy. These other things deal with the energy. And so you skip doing the 3Ds and you go to the 4Ss. And so you have your 4S1, 4S2, and then after the 4S2, you have dun, 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 the 3D1. Because the 3D apparently is a lower energy than the 4P. So that's why you have the, the shifts here. And then we have something interesting that I will go back to this slide. Hunt's rule. You guys all know Hunt's rule? Yeah. What does it say? You can't just go up, down, up, down, across. You have to fill all the ups in each line. Okay. You fill all the ups first and then you put the downs in. Why? Lower energy. You picked up on the pattern. Everything is about lower energy. If you have two magnets, you put them next to each other. If they're like this, they're going to be sticking together. If they're like this, they're going to go like that, that again. Right? You have lower energy if they're aligned. And so since we're talking about magnetic moments here with the, the spin, when you put them in, they're going to align to give you lower energy. So when you put the first electron into a, a, a 2P, the first electron we say spin up, the second electron will be another spin up. So you're going to go from ML equals minus one half with the first one, ML is equal to zero with the second one, ML is equal to one for the third one, right? So they're all aligned. Then the next one's going to can't anti line. Hence my picture's here. The correct is up, up, up. Incorrect, up, down, up. So his Hoot's rule, as Ryan said, is just based on lower energy. So now we see something interesting. If you look at the fourth period here, when it comes into focus, we have 4s2, 3d1. It's argon, so you take whatever argon had, and then you add a 4d1, or a 4s2 and a 3d1. 4s2, 3d2, 4s2, 3d3, 4s1, 3d5. Explain that. It's science, lower energy. Wow, those are just like perfect explanations. And, and correct, I mean. So we have the 4S and the 3D. And what you have there is... They're all aligned together. Instead of having this one have one anti-aligned, it's lower energy to have them all aligned together. And so you basically had a pro promotion from a 4S to a 3D to get to lower energy. And so chromium has an out of order filling, and then you have what you would expect for manganese. And then you keep going on and again, Copper, well, copper is the only one that's out of sequence. Copper, again, it promoted to have one spin by itself in the 4S and the D completely filled. 
So we have some interesting behaviors there. Why do we have a gap here? This is a question that we've already answered, just making sure we're clear. There are no Ds in that region. Why? Because it's higher energy than putting in the four S's. So what should we have when we get down to four? What possible values can I have for L if I am at, at N equals four? Zero to three. So that's S, P, D, F. So I have F orbitals available when I get to the fourth period. But we only have three Ds. We don't have any four Fs. Everyone now should be able to tell me, why are there no four Fs there? Too much energy. They're too high energy. So where does the four F come in? In the bottom table first. Between barium and LU, I don't know that one, lutetium, between barium and lutetium, let's go with that. Anybody know how to pronounce it better? Well, it's got two T's there. Lutetium, I don't know. You have what we call the lanthanide series, which is putting in your F's. And I say you're putting in your F's, and you look here at lanthium, and you're like, there's no F there. You have your F's filling in as you go along. And you have some interesting interactions here. You see it had for um, cerium. Um, huh? See, the, that word? Oh, you're you're talking about you're talking about seventy one. Yes. I thought you were talking about fifty eight. I'm like, no, <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so this one here has an F D N and has all all listed there. It's kind of interesting, but these are where you're filling in those four Fs. So the periodic table, as we now understand it. Is, is explainable with quantum physics and the underlying principle, the electrons are going to the lowest available energy levels, always. And so that's how we get the table. Now this is the year of the periodic table. Why is it the year of the periodic table? Because my calendar says so, that's a good answer. You can go with that. So Put sure. Know, we have a new year anniversary. That do not fit, so we need a new one. No, we just completed it. Oh. The periodic table is now complete. If you look at the periodic tables we purchased five years ago when we moved in, you have element. Un, un, oh, what is the T? I forget. Oh, un, 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 tray or un, un, tricky, I don't know. One, one, three. And un, un, pent. pent. And un un set, and un un ox. But nowadays we have names for these. We have, you know, neonium and what is it? Muscovium, and I don't remember the names of the other new ones. And so everything that's printed on a standard periodic table now has been discovered, has an approved name, which is only done after it's gone through extensive uh, confirmation of the discovery. That's why it's the year of the periodic table. Was it finished this year? Um, actually, I said it's the one year anniversary. It might have been two years ago. Yeah, it takes a while to get this complete, or to get, the, get things rolling. And who's, who made the International Year of the uh, Periodic Table in our chemical society, I think? <laughs> yeah. So, I was talking to a student, and the student said, I doubt it's complete. I said it's complete because we have filled in everything that we draw on that diagram. Does that mean those are the only elements possible? No. You would have to have a whole lot of energy to make new elements, but how did they make these elements to begin with? How did these here, notice this one here, is more than five years old because it doesn't have some of them that are named on that one. How did they make these? Or for that, for that matter, 
How did we get Neptunium, Plutonium, Americium, Cesium, Berkeley, and California? They are highly unstable, and they're created by bombarding things. You create Neptunium by bombarding uranium with, with neutrons. You can you create plutonium by bombarding neptunium with with electrons, and so these here, all of these are man-made. On that diagram, you see it looks from here like you have a bunch of empty cells. That's because those are all man-made. Those aren't naturally occurring, and so they were only created by humans in the lab. Somewhere down the line, you can bet your bottom dollar somebody's going to come up with another element that's going to go down to n equals 8. Right? It has to be possible, but it's going to take a lot of energy to make it. Okay, for our last trick, I logged in on this and forgot to go to the website. We're going to talk about what the orbitals look like, what n, l, and m, what they do to the shape of an orbital. And, um, and you probably have seen these in some fashion or another, but I just want the Orbitron. The Orbitron winter groups, yeah. And it doesn't work on this computer, which is why I'm doing it on a different one. This website is totally cool. It's Here's a 1s orbital. Oh, that is really boring. What does this orbital represent? It's where a high probability, I don't know if it says 95%, here different authors will use a different percentage. But it's where you have a high probability of finding the electron. So if you're in a 1s, it's a nice spherical distribution. And this has things to show you like the electron density. This is actually telling you, you know, how much probability per unit volume there is of finding the electron. And if you look at this, you're like, wow, it has the highest probability per unit volume near the nucleus. But there's not much volume in the nucleus. And so we have another one here that's showing what you have if you take into account the volume. And so this is the probability of being at different radii. And you see, oh, well, here is the most probable distance from the radius, which is the Bohr radius for hydrogen atom. So that's for a 1s. What do you suppose a 2s looks like? A little farther, similar. The 2s, notice you have two regions. You have the blue sphere and then a smaller red sphere inside. There's a region where you're not likely to find it in here. And then, so it's, it's too low. Here's what the wave function looks like, the um, telling us what the probabilities are going to be like. Um, here's the radial distribution, which is what really is important. And you see, here's by far the most probable place to find it. You can't have it here, but you could have the electron in here. What about a 2p? What do 2p orbitals look like? Like a bow tie. <laughs> like a bow tie. Here's, remember we have m sub l, three different values for m sub l, so these are for the three different values of m sub l. So we have three different orientations of that dumbbell. And once again, we can look at the radial distribution, and it looks just like it did for the 1s. 3s, and now we're running low on time, so I've got to go quickly. You have now a hole in the center two likely regions. Here's your radial distribution. There actually is a probability of being in here, but it didn't reach their probability level for drawing another ring. 3P, what's a 3P going to look like? More like a doorknob, an old-fashioned doorknob. It has two lobes on each side, and once again, you have three M sub L, so you have three variations. 3Ds, we, now we got to go real quickly. 
you have five different M sub L, so you have five different variations here. And notice this one here is distinctly different from the others. Um, let's just go 4P, a little more interesting on the doorknob design. 4D, much more interesting. A 4F. Most people, like you're taking chemistry, you're not thinking about where the electrons are probable to be found, but where the electrons are likely to be found contributes to its bonding characteristics. We have some hybrid orbitals. If you ever want to see what an SP1, SP2, or SP3 looks like, there they are. And DSP3, if you care, DSP or D2, SP3. And then we have examples of bonding and anti-bonding sigma bonds. So this is now looking at molecular bonds. And if you have the sigma um, star, that means anti-bonding. As you bring the atoms closer together, their electron clouds repel each other. Clearly, it's not going to bond if they're repelling each other. Whereas if we do the sigma bonding, as they come together, the electron clouds merge and form a molecular orbital where the electron is shared between them. And finally, you can look down here and you can look at um, things like a single bond with P orbitals. Uh, that was anti-bonding, sorry. Here's the bonding one. And so it, it really, I think, is helpful to understand what's going on. Here is a double bond. Oh, anti-bonding again. I always click the anti-bonding. Here's the double bond. Yeah, to see what's going on. All right, we're out of time. This Orbitron website is totally cool.